one, two, one, two, the revolution will be individualized through ordinary people like you and me who wake up to the fact that we're not as ordinary as we were led to believe. What's happening, everybody? This is TK Coleman. Welcome to the Revolution of One, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays at noon, coming at you live. To TK's Two Cents on Tuesdays and Thursdays, where I take a couple of tweets from the week and I take you beyond 280 characters or however many they give us. And then on Wednesday, it's Kamau and I hanging out conversational, usually with another guest, talking about what's happening right now and how you can use the philosophy of freedom to create a better you and to create a freer society uh, through the actions that you take. I'm excited about today because I've been hearing a whole lot of conversations about cancel culture. There's a lot of fear, there's a lot of debate, there's a lot of concern. And uh, you know, I, I wrote a post maybe about uh, a week or two ago and it was about free speech. And I'll talk a little bit about what that post said and, and where I was coming from when I wrote it. But then I, I got into an interesting back and forth with one of my colleagues, brother Sean Malone, who's the creative director here at Fee. And uh, Sean and I have been working together for years. And we got into a back and forth talking about it. And yeah. we had such contrasting perspectives that I was like, hey, man, you need to come on a live stream. And we need to talk about this because I, I think this will be a conversation that other people will be interested in hearing, and I'll just love to see where this goes, you know, if we take it beyond uh, commenting back and forth on Facebook. And, and besides, him and I are so busy with work, we, we got to figure out a way to, to make it a part of work in order for us to be able to do it nowadays. So I got Sean Malone on. We're going to talk about free speech, cancel culture. Should we be worried? Uh, our differences and our shared convictions on a topic. Sean, man, what's up, brother? Hey, man, how you doing? It, you are I'm right, good. by the way, 100% like we have to book time to hang out at this point, like literally have to schedule it. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's good to see you though. It's crazy, man. But, but it's good. It means that, that, that we're being productive, that we're taking our gifts and talents and, and we're actually, yeah. you know, committing ourselves to projects that mean something to us. Well, let's dive right in, man. Um, I, yeah. I think a good way to start would be for me to read this Facebook post that I wrote and, <clears throat> and then maybe just give like a, a minute or two of commentary and then read your comment and we can go from there. Yeah. All right, here's the post. It's a long post. Freedom of speech does not equal freedom from backlash. Cause and effect is still real. Social consequences are still real. The, this whole idea of, of, I can't say anything nowadays is simply not true. You can say whatever you want. You just have to be willing to own the risk that come along with what you say. Is it true that some people will misunderstand you or mislabel you when you use your voice? Absolutely. This has always been true. There has always been a social cost for publicly declaring your beliefs, especially if those beliefs have anything to do with philosophy, politics, religion, or race. Heck, I've even been hated on for using my voice to tell people to follow their dreams. It comes with the territory. For some people, however, this is just the first time they've experimented with the process of sharing their beliefs about polemic topics in a space where they're likely to be challenged or criticized. But fair or unfair, these are social realities that must be contended with for anyone who chooses to use their voice. These realities force us to be honest with ourselves about what's worth saying and what we're willing to fight for. When you see your favorite political pundit or thought leader making provocative claims, it can be easy to think, oh, that's a fun way to talk. But it's important to remember that many of those people have weighed the costs for what they choose to say. You can't just copy their words without copying their cost. Have you weighed the cost of what you choose to say? Don't just ask, what do I want to say? Also ask, what price am I willing to pay? And if you choose to be silent, because you're not willing to pay the price for what you wish to say, it's important to be honest with yourself about your true priorities and your current level of readiness. Many people who say, I am being silenced, really just mean speaking up scares the heck out of me, so I'm just going to shut up and blame it on society for not allowing me to get a word in. If you choose not to use your voice, that's your choice, but own it as a choice because one day you might decide it's time to speak and that day will never come 
unless you learn to see yourself as a person with agency who has the power to choose. I believe the world is a better place when we all choose to share our thoughts, but we have to be brutally honest with ourselves about what we can handle and what we're willing to sacrifice in the name of making a point. These realities are not going to magically disappear after the next news cycle or the next election. The most important conversations will always be the most risky conversations. I'm gonna just skip to your comment. <laughs> Come back. Owning risk is one thing, fostering a society that is perpetually offended and hostile to different ideas is another. Let's talk about this, man, because uh, yeah. clearly there seems to be a clash there. Yeah. What, 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 we, well, what did you is. feel when you read my post? What made you want to say that? So there is and there isn't, right? Like, and you and I have talked about a lot of this stuff a lot of times. And I agree really emphatically with like 99.999% of everything in that post, man. I think that post is phenomenal. I think in particular, what I thoroughly agree with is that like, you have to feel the agency to speak up. And if you're afraid, or if you don't want to bear the consequences of what you're speaking, like that, that's your choice, but that is indeed your choice. Like you have to make that decision for yourself. And, and I've been somebody, I mean, you guys know this probably you're, you know, the, the audience listening to this probably doesn't know this. I'm somebody who's made that choice again and again and again and again over a lot of years. And I've, I've paid prices for it sometimes and I've, I've benefited from it a lot, right? One, one of the things I find that's really valuable about, you know, using your free speech is that at some point, you know, unless you're saying things that everybody literally like thinks are absolutely the worst things in the world, you will eventually find an audience and a voice. And, and as you do that, you, you get better and better at, at conveying your ideas and all, all that kind of stuff. And will maybe eventually actually find benefits. For example, I am now creative director of an organization getting to say the kinds of things that I was saying for free at a cost when I was living in Los Angeles or New York City working in the entertainment industry, right? Like I, I had a bad time communicating a lot of those, the, the same kinds of things when I was in those environments. I'm having an awesome time doing it now. And that was only possible because I took those initial steps to say, okay, you know what, I'm gonna pay a price with some of my relationships, some of my business partnerships, things like that, for talking about some of these ideas, worth it, 100% worth it. And I'd pay that price again any day of the week, um, you know, for the rest of my life. It, it would not even be a question. Um, where, and oh, by the way, the other thing I wanna, I wanna thoroughly agree with is the idea that your, um, the way that you communicate with people and the way that they perceive your communication is something that you have to take ownership of as well. Like there are a lot of different approaches to communication, some of which are going to get you yelled at or slapped or, you know, I mean, there's ways to approach people and to start conversations with people that are really effective. There are other ways that are really not effective. And it, it's never made a lot of sense to me to blame your audience for their reaction. Now, with all of those caveats in place, I also want to say, like, I am a really, really strong by, by, believer. By the, way, in by the way, you sound like a sports commentator, Stephen A. Smith. Before he disagrees, he always gives, yeah. like, the best, most flattering, like, man, let me tell you how you are more right than anybody else. Then he well, tears you, you down. You are. This is not. This is not a major disagreement. My my <laughs> challenge is. My challenge is. I also am a strong believer in free speech, and part of that for me is is fostering society where people are comfortable with disagreement and don't immediately try to shout other people down or cut their mic mm. or you know like show up at their events and, and try to, you know, try to shut the lights off or, or drown them out or whatever. And we've seen a lot of that over the last several years. I mean, over the last eight, eight years or so, seven or eight years, we've seen more and more and more of this kind of deplatforming movement and, and different kinds of people, you know, haven't been in, literally haven't been allowed to speak. Right. So there's one thing of paying a price because 
people just react negatively to what you're saying. I think it's another thing entirely, and this is where I think cancel culture really is a problem, is where they are literally showing up to your speech and trying to stop you from, from talking, flat out trying to stop you from talking. There's, that is to me the line between, between paying, you know, having consequences for your ideas and actually having society where people are being illiberal and trying to, you know, violate the core principles of free speech, which is that people should in fact not be, you know, uh, not be physically silenced, right? Which I do think is happening in some cases. And that's what I wanted to talk about, I think, because I, I do think that like we want to foster a society where people are open to disagreement without, you know, literally losing their minds and rioting or trying to silence people or doing any of that kind of stuff or doxing them and, you know, exposing their private information, you know, trying to get them fired in most cases. I mean, I think there are, there are a few cases. One just came up actually with a guy named Blake Neff who, who worked for Tucker Carlson, who was on, I don't know if you guys saw this, but he was on, um, like this really like embarrassingly racist forum and he was making racist jokes and stuff. And um, it, honestly, it was really, really bad. And then I, and I did, I talked to people about this and I got some, oh, I thought you were against cancel culture and all this, but that to me is a very different situation because this is a person who is representing an organization and who is empowered. He was a writer for Tucker Carlson's show. And so he got fired, you know, like kind of immediately. And um, that's the kind of thing I go, and, I've, and I said this publicly on Facebook the other day, you know, Kamau writes content for fee, you write content for fee, I write content for fee. There's a lot of people that work for me who, if I caught them on that kind of forum, writing the kinds of stuff that this guy was writing, they couldn't write for fee anymore. That's, it, it just, it would reflect such a poor, you know, poor character judgment, poor ideas, things that completely go against our values. So I, I don't think in every case you want to say, oh, nobody should ever get fired because of what they say. But I think we've gone, I think the pendulum swung a little too far. I think there are a lot of cases where people have gotten really, you know, destroyed over stuff that they've said that, you know, either just didn't connect right or which, you know, other people were looking for. And that's what I'm more concerned about. That's, that's what I wanted to talk about here. Yeah, I think those are all, all good points. So I, I think the question that I'm asking myself as I sort of listen to the debates right now, because I'm I, I have never advertised myself as TK Coleman, cancel culture expert, free speech expert. You know, um, I have my voluntary beliefs about these things, but I'm still working a lot of this stuff out. The question yeah. I'm asking right now is. Should cancel culture or this phenomenon that we call cancel culture <laughs> Be, be framed as the enemy of free speech or as the predictable expression of a world in which free speech exists. So, so for instance, I'll give you an example, like, you know, cause I think there are a lot of analogies between free speech and free markets as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, I have heard my fellow cap capitalists, my fellow voluntarists for years respond to people's concerns about how how markets will deal with things like discrimination or bigotry by saying things like oh it's all about economic incentives right it's all about economic incentives and and they would give yeah. these explanations for how it would happen and then you see a company say hey look we're gonna pull aunt jemima you know off the shelves because we we, we love our money so much we we, <laughs> we love our self-interest so much that we are deathly afraid of how much being seen as racist will negatively affect our pocketbooks, right? And, yeah. and so what you have is a fear-based, economically incentivized form of virtue signaling. And by the way, I, I believe that capitalism is nothing more than a giant profit-based virtue signaling machine. Uh, it, it's <laughs> just that virtue signaling is really hard to do and be effective at, at the same time. And when people see through it, they hate it, it disgusts them. But when you get it yeah. right, it's like good acting. The best actors are the ones who make you forget that they're yeah. acting. But I believe that for the most part, when your bartender or barista serves you, they don't actually like you. 
I, I think they're I, I think they're your, virtues. I, I think you replied on the on that thread to that effect, and I, I thought that was a really good reply to a large extent. And you're you're 100 right. Like bartenders, you know, waiters, stuff like that. Like, and you know, obviously you you have that background a little bit too. Of like, you know, you're going in if you're having a bad day, if you're if you're you know if you don't even like the customer in particular for some reason you're still, you're incentivized pretty strongly to go in there and say, hey, I, I love you. How can I serve you today? Let me make this experience the best possible experience we can we can get. And I don't think, I think you're right about all of that. And I, and I think that like capitalism does foster that kind of behavior among people, right? I think the well, well, question- What I wanted to say about that really quickly though, yeah. what I wanted to say about that really quickly is when I see that happening, I think to myself, that's capitalism too. Right. Like like capitalism doesn't mean I I love my customers or that I love the way businesses cater to their customers, because you see business cater to their customers all the time in ways that you might despise. But like that's what you get with the free market. A free market doesn't mean that you won't have any yeah. restaurants where businesses won't cater to your political opponents out of fear, you know, and, and, and so I'm bringing it back to this free speech. When I look at this stuff, I think to myself, but wait, a group of obnoxious students hanging around trying to drown out somebody giving a speech because they disagree, a group of obnoxious, immature babies who go la 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 just because they don't like what you're saying, that's kind of why we have to fight for free speech. Yeah. Like, like yeah. that's why free speech matters. Like, yeah. shouldn't that be what we expect? And, and instead of being like, oh no, we're victims, Shouldn't we step up our game and be more creative and, and, and critical in our thinking about what we want to say and how to get? Yeah, dude, I, I, I think there's two things here, one of which you're, you're dead on about. I think the like playing the victim card in all of this is complete waste of time, regardless of whether or not you feel like it's true. It doesn't do anybody any good at all. And it actually is just kind of embarrassing because it's, just, it's like a couple obnoxious people can stop you from saying something that's important when you clearly have the power to say what you want. Maybe you have to change your form or whatever. So I, I am not on, in favor of, you know, playing that as some kind of kind of victimhood. Um, you know, and, and likewise, I, I do think that it, 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 it is a predictable, I mean, it's, it's a predictable response in a lot of ways, right? You're, anytime you're saying anything worthwhile, you're going to have, I think, I mean, sorry, this is, this is my own bias coming in. I am, I am very strongly in favor of free speech. So anytime anybody tries to like stop people from, from communicating or, or tries to tell people to shut up, even if I don't like their views. And I think that's the really important part. And it's something I want to talk about a little bit on this too, because I very, very strongly believe that exposing yourself to viewpoints that you do not think you agree with is incredibly important. And that's part of why I'm such a, a hardcore advocate for this stuff. But, you know, it's to be expected that if you say something somebody doesn't like, they're going to get upset about it, or potentially they're going to get upset about it. So I'm not too surprised by any of that. That said, the thing what I would also say is, there's also room in, in free markets for disagreement and challenging you know, these kinds of decisions, right? So you, you use the examples of, of, you know, restaurants and stuff like that. If a restaurant started to cater only to Republicans, for example, or only to Democrats, for example, I, I would both say, and I think there's no contradiction here, they are free to do that as a private business. And I would support their right as individual business owners to make that decision. I would also criticize them for making that decision. I think that that's a bad decision. And I would explain why I think that's a bad decision to, to polarize their, their customer base like that. Um, it's their choice to make. And I fully recognize and appreciate that that's their choice. It's still within my right to say, I disagree with that choice. I think it's a bad one. And by the way, I personally will not be patronizing your business as a result, right? So yeah, I yeah. think it's a blend of things. Like I don't, I don't, I think all of these things are, you know, you're, you're not free from the consequences, but neither are the businesses who make those decisions. Right. Like, so it's all, you know, it's all individual choice at that point, which I, I, I agree with just 
just because something's individual choice doesn't mean you can't criticize it though. You know, I think yeah. I'll hop in, um, you know, when, when I think about kind of the title of this live stream, should we be worried about cancel culture? And I think Sean, you, you brought up two good points. And I think that there is a difference. I think on one side, you know, people who, who hear what you have to say, Sean, um, and are worried about cancel culture, I think that there's people like you who are trying to educate others about the importance of listening to opinions that aren't necessarily in line with their own. And, and that's fine. And I think that definitely has a place. But to TK's point about um, feeling victimized from uh, the results and the responses to your ideas, to your perspectives, to um, you know, having the courage to speak out, it's, it's to be expected. And I, I, and I don't think that anybody um, should necessarily be worried um, about being canceled. I think by being worried about being canceled, you're as a result going to cancel yourself. You're, you're not even going to give yourself an opportunity to speak because fear of backlash. And I, so I, I think kind of the way that this is worded, um, I think worried is definitely the wrong direction. I think everybody here can yeah. pretty much agree with um, there's no need uh, to be worried. But I think throughout history, you know, I, I specifically think about the civil rights um, and and I kind of go back to the adage of the truth will set you free. And the truth yeah. is kind of in, you know, it's it's unique to you in your individual perspective, but the truth will set you free. And, and if you're speaking a, a, a message of truth, your audience is out there. The people who need to hear what you have to say are out there and they're going to connect. And whether the majority agrees with it or not does not mean it's not the truth. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's just important to remember because in the civil rights movement, you know, the truth that they were experiencing was not the popular opinion, um, was right. a very unpopular opinion. And they got tremendous amounts of backlash. You know, anytime you're fighting against oppression, you're going to, that's to be expected. Um, but, you know, to be worried about being canceled, to be worried about the backlash, you know, is, is to, as a result, like cancel yourself out. Yeah, I, man, I, first of all, I think that's a beautiful example of both, both of these points, really, because on the one hand, you're right, you need the courage to stand up there and continue to fight for the things that you think are true and that you believe in and that, that are important to you regardless of, of what other people are going to say or, or what the response is going to be without that, you, you will cancel yourself and that will be, you know, just as devastating as, as somebody else doing it to you or, or whatever. But, um, but also it's, it's exactly why I think it's so important to, to try as much as possible to build a culture that allows for tolerance of different people's viewpoints. Like if you think about the civil rights movement, there were, legal barriers to speaking out and legal barriers to civil disobedience and and you know all of those kinds of things which i think i mean certainly everybody here you know the three of us um would all agree are are ludicrous and should never exist but also there were a lot of social barriers as well that i think we would probably also agree would have been a lot better had they not existed right like people shouting other people down when they you know stand on the, on the steps of the courthouse and say hey i should be allowed to go to school with anybody else or i should be allowed to serve whichever customers i want in my business you know things like that i i think we would have been better as a society in general if there had been tolerance for multiple perspectives without people you know yelling at each other of course the fact that everybody's yelling at them is precisely why those conversations needed to happen but you know, I, I think there are a lot of instances of this kind of stuff. Um, another one that, that I was thinking about, because um, I'm, I'm writing, a, a unrelated to this specific conversation, I'm writing a, another uh, episode of Out of Frame that's kind of connected to these ideas a little bit. But um, there's a, an example from last year, actually, if you guys remember this um, guy named um, Carson King, who I, I forget what... what um, football game he was at. He was a, he was just a guy watching a football game. It was televised on ESPN. ESPN's cameras kind of came in and found a sign that he had, which said, help me, I need money to replenish my, my supply of Bush beer. 
And so Anheuser-Busch, and it, this was, you know, big, big moment. Anheuser-Busch, um, you know, part, they, they reached out to him. They partnered with him. They ended up raising over a million dollars for a children's hospital in Iowa. And, um, and then in the Des Moines Register article about him, they pulled up some old tweets. This guy was 24 years old. He'd made some insensitive jokes, too, that they found um, that were like, they were racially insensitive, really kind of just dumb teenager jokes. And those two tweets from when he was 16, like, turned the entire story into, you know, this guy's a monster. He's a racist. He's horrible. He's the worst person ever. And by the way, when the Des Moines Register piece came out, he was quoted in it saying, like, I'm surprised. I I don't even remember tweeting those things. Like I'm so embarrassed. Like that when I was, I'm so embarrassed with what I thought was funny when I was 16 and all of this kind of stuff. And, but my point is like the million dollars that he raised for a children's hospital and the person that he grew up to be, which by all accounts seems to be a very nice, not racist, not mean, awful, mean spirited person. Um, you know, that didn't matter because the, the tweets that he wrote at 16, became the major story. So Bush dropped him, d dropped their partnership, like all the, the funds dried up, all that kind of stuff. That's for me, that's just, that's not the world I wanna live in, right? Like the world I wanna live in is a little bit more forgiving and a little bit more tolerant than that. It's, it's a world that says like, people don't always say the right thing. They don't, they don't always behave in ways that are, that are particularly polite, especially when you're 16 or 17 years old, people do dumb stuff that we should, not rush to make into the defining feature of their entire lives and to actually try to look at the more holistic picture. That's the kind of stuff when I think about cancel culture, that's what I think about. I, I, I don't think about somebody just like disagreeing, but somebody like bringing a mob down on somebody for something that is, you know, either something they did decades ago, or I mean, we've got other examples, obviously, like you've got Kevin Hart being you know, booted from the Oscars. Um, you know, there's there's all kinds of stuff the, like that that I think about. That's what I'm getting at. I, I, I think you're you're absolutely right when you say you should not be afraid of the backlash. And I don't think Carson King should have been like preemptively, oh man, maybe I said something bad when I was 16. I better not do anything for these kids. You know, like I'm much, I, I'm glad that he, like regardless of whatever he may have said when he was younger or whatever his that his first thought when he had an opportunity to make a difference was to raise millions of dollars for this children's hospital i think it's fantastic um it would be a much worse world if he if he went well god i'm afraid of being canceled so i i better not even get in the spotlight at all like that's not the world that we want either you know but those are the th kinds of things that i'm that i'm more concerned about i wouldn't say worried for the reasons that come out that you said, but I think, I, you know, I, I want a particular kind of society, right? And I, and I want it to be tolerant in a, in a broader way, not just in a, like, kind of surface level way. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, go ahead, come out. I was just gonna say that I, I, I thought that like I, I definitely agree with 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 your general um, with the general direction, but you know, I think I would push back and say that um, you know backlash just can be a good teacher. Um, I I think you know it, it 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 can definitely teach you you know as as a business. Obviously, like this one individual wasn't operating as a business, but I think you know backlash from what um, society or, or or what your customers um, you know. What they don't like, you're going to learn from that. You're going to change your behavior or your product accordingly. And I think that um, backlash, in a way, can be humbling. Um, and I think it, it can it can further you to develop your character. Uh, it it all really depends on the kind of person you are and how you take uh, how you take backlash. And then also, you know, what form that backlash uh, that backlash manifests in. Um, you know, we had a guest on here. Uh, a couple couple episodes back that was talking about his daughter and how she had a lot of experience with um, 
you know, with racism in like elementary school. And, and she was talking to her dad and she was just saying to him, you know, dad, I'm, I'm, I'm having, you know, this, this inner battle, like I'm really struggling not to hate white people. And, you know, instead of just kind of jumping to this, you know, the, this like, no, absolutely. You should not feel that way. He kind of let her just feel through the space. And I think she got yeah. into a space. Well, where, well, she was able to, you know, kind of navigate those feelings where she was like, you, you know, I know that's not right because so-and-so or because uncle this person or auntie this person. And, and then the love that they have for me. And, you know, despite kind of the experiences I've had, these people still care about me. But I, I you know, I, I think it's just... I think what that point illustrated to me um, what, was that you kind of learn in real time um, from, yeah. from like society, from experiences. And then I think, you know, it, it really is just about the kind of person you are. Like if you can mm -hmm. deal with backlash, you can deal with negative experiences and, and, and look at that as a learning opportunity and not feel victimized from the result of, you know, of a behavior that you took. Yeah, I and, I and I agree with that. I mean, I certainly think, I, so like the Carson King example, though, I think what's interesting to me about it a little bit is that I think he had already learned, you know, just by product of growing up, not to find, like he didn't find the same things funny anymore. He didn't find, he, he realized as he became an adult that the things that he said at 16 weren't appropriate, you know, and it, it seems like he was trying to be a pretty good guy. And then, you know, we dragged that stuff up from, from, you know, 10 years ago or whatever in that case. And, and that's the thing, like, it's not, I think you're the example of, of your guest daughter. It's like, imagine how she will feel about, and I don't know, right? Like I, however she will feel about all of this stuff 10 years from now, if we judged her based on whatever her most angry reaction was at 16 years old or 15 or, or whatever. And then 10 years from now we say, well, that's who you are and that's who you will always be. Like that's where I think it gets to be something that I think is worthy of criticism on a social level, like on, you know, not, I'm not saying like whatever her experiences were, she, you know, she has a right to feel however she wants. Right. Um, and that's, and that's fine. But I think as a society, the society that I want is to be able to look back 10 years ago and say like, this does not mean, because you said X, Y, or Z 10 years ago, this is, I think also the Kevin Hart Oscar thing for me is like, you said this 10 years ago, like you're not the same person anymore. You don't necessarily agree with all of those same things. Like just because you were insensitive in this moment in time, does not mean that you are a horrible person for all time, right? And those are the kinds of things that I think we get into a little bit of trouble with, with this, you know, with the cancel culture idea. It also silences people, right? It also stops people from having those more, for me, what are more interesting and more challenging conversations about like, yeah, not everybody's ideas are perfect. Not everybody grows up fully formed either. So like the stuff you thought was true six years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever, you learn, you grow, right? Like hopefully as a human being, you're growing a little bit over time. And, um, you know, to kind of create a system where all we're doing is, is blasting people for those kinds of things, it, it does have a chilling effect. Now, again, with that caveat of like, it's on you as an individual to rise above that, and to decide whether or not what you want to say is worth the risk, right? That is still your choice. But, you know, m my point is just I'd like to live in a society where the risks were a little bit lower in general, because I, I think we benefit from having these conversations. I think we benefit from not being, you know, so cut off from different people's experiences, you know? Yeah, you know, it, yeah. this is interesting for me because, um, there, there is a sense in which when I step back and I look at what people are talking about when they discuss cancel culture, where to just be honest, it's it's kind of hard for me to understand. 
and it's kind of hard for me to understand, not because I'm removed from cancel culture, but because I feel like cancel culture is just a new word for a context within which I've lived my entire life. I, I feel like I can't think of a moment in my personal history where I did not have to achieve this very delicate balancing act mm -hmm. between what I'm trying to create and all the different ways that people can misunderstand you or mislabel you because of something yeah. that someone hears about your past or because of you know a, a joke that you make that doesn't land right or because of a mm -hmm. philosophical opinion that you express and people get surprisingly offended by it. I, yeah. I can't think of a time when that wasn't true. You know, I'll give you an example. I remember um, when when I was in high school, um, you know, at, at this time, I'm, I'm going to a majority white high school, living in a majority white neighborhood. There was this arcade that a lot of the kids would go to at that time. And there were only about a handful of black people in my school at this time. And, and there were two guys that I went to the arcade with one day. And, you know, we were, you know, predictably so the only black people in this arcade, right? We walked into the arcade. And soon as we walked in, these police officers, like, they, they were on us. They were like following us around. Now, just to show you how far removed I am from anything remotely called the victim mentality, my mom had already taught me that when things like this happen, rejoice because God is giving you an opportunity to be in the spotlight so that you can destroy the stereotypes these people have. Okay. So I wasn't thinking like, oh, I'm a victim because they look at me because I'm a black, I'm black. I was like, oh, this is great because I know I'm about to conduct myself as well as anybody else here. This is great. The fact that they might be following us because of that reason is fantastic because I'm about to show them what some brothers look like when they come into the arcade to be at the arcade for the same reasons as everybody else. They're following you us know, around. And in my head, not because I think I'm a victim. You are my favorite person ever. Sorry, man. This, what? this is precisely why you are my favorite person ever, by the way. Like, I love you to yeah. death for exactly this, this mentality, man. It's amazing. Yeah, so I, I'm not looking at it as like, oh, man. These, these cops are following us around and, and, and I'm a victim because of this, right? I'm positive about it. So anyway, we're, we're walking around, we're playing games, we're behaving normally, not even loitering or looking like we're doing anything weird. And um, at one point we see a couple of girls from our high school, they actually see us and, and we're like, hey, how's it going? And you know, we hug them and we talk with them for a couple of minutes and then they walk off and we go back to doing our thing, playing the games. And those cops walked up to us shortly after that, and they said to us, this isn't the kind of place to be loitering and coming to just to hit on girls. And we were like, what? Yes. Like, what? Yes. What are you talking about? 100% right? it is that place, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but but even then, I, I'm, I'm sure he had that perception because maybe that's what other kids do there, but that's not even what we were doing, right? Like, we ran into a couple of girls yeah. from school, yeah. and yeah. we weren't even talking with him that long. And um, he was like, I'm not arguing with you, gentlemen. Have a good night. And, and, and have a good night. Like he meant he was telling us we had to go. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and, and I was kind of miffed by it because I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I just did the thing mama told me to do. I just put on a freaking display. And you telling me you're trying to use my display of like, like I behave better than everybody in this place. And you're trying to tell me that I got to leave. And I, and I was miffed. And um and I, I said, we didn't even do anything. And he says, good day, gentlemen. And I got mad and I actually said, oh, okay. Is because of this right here? Is that what it is? You know? Um, and, and look, I don't apologize to anybody for, for asking that because even to this day, I genuinely believe that's the reason why. And I don't believe that my believing that makes me a victim or makes me believe that the majority of white people are racist or the majority sure. of cops are yeah. bad. I just believe that there are individual people in society who happen to yeah. make poor judgment calls based on superficial information and because they might be jerks or unfair. And those guys get to be jerks who were unfair and who were incorrect all by themselves. And I don't have to be yeah. a victim for pointing out their idiocy, right? Uh, and I don't have to apologize to all white people and make everybody feel bad for saying, sorry guys, 
these two guys on the white team were bad, just like I got to be real about guys on the black team who do stupid stuff. Ain't no team, but you get the you, you get the joke. But um, man, the, I remember uh, I dude, that dude, the, you don't have to tell me. I am the most. I am. I am a yeah, hardcore I individualist. I do not. I do not take umbrage yeah. to that. Right? Like you found. Yeah, I, 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 some, I, don't, I know. I know. I got to tell you that. Yeah, yeah. Words. I'm but, trying but, to but, avoid. But, want to use here but you found some bad guys it's what you found yeah yeah absolutely so when when i left this was such a weird interesting stunning story to me right and i couldn't yeah. help but talk about it you know i'm like a, a sophomore in high school i couldn't help but talk about it and when i talked about it i found something out really fast and it's something that has been I've seen it illustrated and played out so many situations. I found out really fast that there are a lot of people in this world who do not like people talking about race. When I yeah. told that story yeah. and expressed the way the, expressed the way I felt about it, the quick response from multiple adults and teachers and mentors that I let let hear me tell that story said, "You shouldn't have spoke to them like that, and don't make this about race." And, and they were more mad about me making it about race than they were about, you know, like empathizing with my anger or anything like that. And, and it was an early lesson. And it was an early lesson in understanding that just because you have something that you believe and that you want to say doesn't mean the people around you want to say it. And there's always a social cost. And as someone who yeah. has like worked in predominantly white spaces most of my life, um, and all these types of things, I have always had to process things that I that I observe, things that I say. I've always had to process it in the sense of, oh, well, will my customers get angry at this? Will my boss yeah. get angry at this? Will my colleagues get angry at this? And it's a very delicate and unfair battle where you often feel like you are doing the most amazing circus like acrobatic moves of creativity just to accommodate yeah. people that you think are complete idiots right and, and, and for me that's the story of life it's the story of life one other quick thing this this isn't even about race i worked with a young lady in a restaurant okay okay go ahead oh, yeah, go, go ahead, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> i want to ask you about something that I heard you talk with Isaac about. It, it was, um, it, it almost seemed like a time in your life where you almost got canceled or people tried to cancel you, where you wrote a blog post that went really viral. Um, and, and it was about your experience with the police. It might even be the same situation. And you got a lot of pushback because of that. So I just want to hear you, um, you know, kind of tell that story about what it was like being canceled and how that matured you um, and how it changed your perspective. Yeah, ha happy to tell that. This other really quick anecdote and then and then that. Worked with a young lady at a restaurant. One yeah. day she had a table that was just rude as hell. All the other servers could see it. And she had a moment, okay, she had a moment. Uh, and in that moment, she expressed to the customer, she didn't swear, she didn't yell. She expressed to the customer that she felt they were being rude. That customer whined like a baby, complained to the manager. It resulted yeah. in that young lady getting fired. Every uh. single server in that restaurant was on her side and was like, ah, man, that wasn't right. Right. That wasn't right. And and we all also understood that this is the game, though. Right. We, we know that businesses kind of have a heightened sense of liability more so than the the individual workers who can just quit and leave right that manager had greater liability than me who can just be like i'm gonna leave this restaurant and go to tgi fridays there's this game right and like even though we all felt like she was canceled we didn't call it that at the time and we felt like that was kind of wrong and unfair and she should have been forgiven there was yeah. also this understanding that as much as we sympathize with her Part of being human and part of what we need to teach our children and teach each other is that there will always be someone who looks for a reason to bring you down, always, no matter who you are. And there will always be someone 
who will listen to you uncharitably and they will try to find the most offensive way possible to twist what you have to say. And we are never gonna wish that away. And, and the only way to deal with that as a society is to take a posture of confidence and strength, which is the total opposite of being like, well, I can't say what I wanna say anymore. That makes you sound like yeah. a guilty person who probably yeah. does have some offensive stuff to say and you know that you're gonna, like we have to step up and demonstrate ourselves to be the kind of people who will speak truth. And mm -hmm. when it's time to pay the costs, we say that sucks and I hate the cost, but I own my choices. And, 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 yeah. and that's how, to me, you create the kind of world where, where truth wins, you know? Um, and for me, it's always been like that. I just kind of feel like the only thing new about cancel culture is the name and that there are some <laughs> people that have never yeah. wrestled with this before but there are some of us who like, yeah, we've been we've been living like this our whole lives. So so I want to I want to jump in on a couple couple things there, because I think you're you're totally right. I, th I do think a lot of people haven't wrestled with this before. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with social media. A lot of that has to do with and I think you and I talked about this a little bit, which is like suddenly there are literally billions of people who are now speaking in a public forum to one degree or another who've never had a public forum before and who for the very first time ever have experienced what it's like to say something in front of a hundred people or 200 or a thousand people or 10,000 people, right? Or in some cases, millions and millions yeah. of people, Yeah, you know? And, and that is, that's, that's scary because suddenly you, you now feel backlash on a scale. Like it's one thing to have like one or two people at your high school go like, eh, that guy's a jerk or whatever, right? Fine, you can deal with that. When you've got 10,000 people coming at you saying like, I hate what you just said, you know, look, I had a guy just now, like I, I literally, I, I never, ever block people ever. It's it, part of a, a rule. It's so rare in 14 years on Facebook with thousands and thousands of, of, of followers and whatnot. I have, I have only 10 people who are blocked and they are well-deserved over a long period of time. I blocked a guy from email today who came to me through YouTube, through our YouTube channel, because he sent me one email a couple days ago that was like, I hated everything you said in the most recent video. And it was kind of a like an unhinged kind of incoherent thing. But I was like, I was genuinely going to respond to this guy. And then he sent me like 15 more emails right after that. And they were all they were all memes or screen caps or like there were, it was, it was like crazy. It was lunatic. I mean, stuff like it's completely unhinged. None of it makes any sense. And so like, I was like, man, I wanted to like start a dialogue with you because like when you come at me with a criticism, my, my, like my instincts, just cause how I am as a human being is to like, Hey man, let's cool. Let's talk about this. Like, I want to get into it with you. Like, and I don't want to have an angry fight about it. Like, I literally value the discussion that can happen as a result of this stuff. Yeah. But this guy was a lunatic. So I was like, all right, well, I, I've got to get out of this. Most people aren't used to that, right? Like, most people are not in any way used to the fact that they could put out a video on YouTube and then have some, like, un literally unhinged person come find them on email or on Facebook or, or Twitter or whatever and then just start, like, kind of losing it on him and stuff. And so I get it. Yeah. There are a lot of people yeah. who, who just haven't experienced that. Like what I want to bring to the discussion is I want a world where on Twitter. So here's the thing that I am genuinely worried about. I'm worried about the ultimate reaction to the way that people are feeling about this stuff, which is the thing that I, I think is most likely. And the thing that I want most desperately to avoid is splitting off social channels to be echo chambers of pockets of different viewpoints. This is the thing that I am most concerned about. What I, cause there are things like Parler that just started, which is like a, a Twitter, you know, competitor basically, but it's already kind of being, becoming the conservative Twitter, right? It's not, now we're getting into a place where it's like liberals are over here and conservatives are over here and they are not allowed to communicate with each other, you know, like, and it's even along racial lines in some cases, right? And that worries me even more because now we have people who don't actually have necessarily disagreements on anything intellectual, but purely like on the basis of, of skin color, which is the 
one stupid thing we years, decades yeah. fighting to, to eliminate, right? Like it's it's insane to me to start watching a world where racial segregation is becoming more and more common, voluntary segregation. Like I don't want white people in this space or I don't want black people in this space. Seems like the most insane thing in the world to me. And so I don't like, that's the stuff that I'm actually concerned about. And it's not like on an individual like level where like, I'm not worried about you guys not being able to have the courage to stand up to somebody who's like, Hey, I hated what you said. Right. Like you're, you're going to be fine. TK, especially like you can handle that, man. Like you can handle that better than anybody I've ever met. But, um, you know, but what I don't want from a, from a broader societal standpoint is these echo chambers to start becoming more and more and more tight. Right. Like I don't want people to go, you're not welcome here you're not welcome over here. And so, because as a result, nobody, like, nobody has a perfect set of knowledge or perfect ideas or perfect value. Nobody has all of the answers all the time, right? So by actually interacting with different people with different perspectives, you get a little closer. And if we all like shut that down and never talk to each other, that's the one thing that I'm actually worried about. But you're right, it's, I don't think it's new. I think it's new. I think the scale of it is a little bit new in certain ways, you know, and that's mostly a function of social social media, right? Like otherwise it was really confined to your your local experience or, or individual experiences and things like that. But now it can immediately be 10,000 people coming after you instead of two people, right? And that's that's the thing that I think is a little bit more concerning, but we, we, I mean, yeah, we, we certainly got to be a lot in some ways, a lot, a lot, uh, smarter, a lot more, um, discerning than previous generations because we, we have, we, we don't have to go through a, a publisher and, and, and a bunch of filters to be able to even be heard. We can go straight online and be heard by a lot of people with no filter. And, and, and I think to, to your earlier point, one of the things that's happening people look at different thought leaders, right? Um, I'll use Candace Owens as an example. When Candace Owens writes a tweet that makes everybody mad, she wins when that happens, right? Like when you think about the game that she's playing, if if a thousand of her enemies retweet what she says, she's winning, right? Like she's selling more books, she, she, she's mobilizing her audience already, she knows yeah. who she's talking to and who she isn't talking to, and so she's calculated the cost and, and the pros and the cons. She knows what game she's playing. But somebody else watches that and they think to themselves, oh yeah, that's a cool way to talk. Oh yeah, I'm gonna say the same thing, right? And then they go on their Facebook page. They don't have a book that they sell it. They don't have a TV show that they're promoting, right? They don't have a brand that they're building. And then they go on Twitter and they say something. And then like all of their friends are like, you're a racist, you're this, you're that. And they're like, oh, you can't say anything. It's like, no, 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 no. Like, like there's a yeah. thought process that you didn't engage in here, right? We're in a new world now where those yeah. thoughts that you had in the past, you probably wouldn't have said them to anybody other than your family and friends. But now you mm -hmm. see these other political pundits, you get emboldened by that and, yeah. and you're not thinking about the cost that comes along with it. And so we, we have to be smarter and we have to really think through um, what it is we wanna say, what points are worth <laughs> making, and, uh, and who we're really talking to and what game that we're playing. But you know, man, I don't, what, what I don't want to, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I don't want to compare, like, I, I really, generally speaking, don't want to be compared to Candace Owens in any way. But what I was saying earlier about, I wasn't um, comparing like, you, man. No, no I, I know. But what, I, what I'm, I'm comparing myself in this one tiny little area, which is what I was saying earlier about, like, I've been able to turn. So I started in the entertainment business where, a, like being a, a libertarian in the entertainment business is is a like a very tiny minority position that is actually not like I think even worse than being a Republican actually in a lot of ways like people are more angry at you for a lot of the things that I that I have said and that I've I've stated as beliefs over the years than I think a standard Republican would get because I think they a lot of times this whole speculation part of this I think a lot of of like entertainment industry progressives want me to be fully aligned with them and think I'm a traitor. Whereas Republicans, I think, 
they just go like, well, they're over there. They're a different. That's a different group. You should be here, but you're not. And that's why, like, I think it's even, I've gotten even more animosity from people in that space. But what I was, what I was getting at though, is that like, I kept speaking up and I kept saying the things that I cared about and that I believe and still believe to be true. And eventually that turned into a career where I get to say those kinds of things and I benefit from saying those things. Now, unlike Candace Owens, I make it, and you guys all know this because I've, I've made it an incredibly important point at Fee, I, I never want to get clicks out of anger or out of, um, you know, like the kind of like red meat clickbait that, that, that those kinds of people like the TPS USA crowd uses because I think that that's ultimately actually damaging. I think in the short term, Candace Owens benefits. In the long term, Candace Owens' credibility and reputation dies, right? Like without, with any, with, with anybody outside of her, her existing tribe, I think she cannot possibly communicate with people. That was the calculated, I don't know if it was calculated or not, but that was the trade-off that she made, right? She made a trade-off between getting lots and lots and lots of attention today um, but at the cost of her ability to communicate with people outside of her, her, you know, top fans, basically, that's not and a trade off I'm interested in making. And certainly it's not one I want fee to make as a result, but I mean, but they're genuine trade offs and you're absolutely right that like the, the people who follow that model, but who don't benefit because they're not selling a book or because they don't have millions of followers or whatever, they're going to pay the costs of the vitriol and the hate and all that stuff, they're gonna pay all of those costs. They're not gonna get any benefit out of that at all. And I don't think they've thought it through. And I agree with you entirely yeah. on that. Yeah. yeah. I want to make one last point, Sean, to, to, to what you just kind of brought up about, you know, just dividing further and, and, and kind of going into these um, ecosystems of social media that are, that are so divided and separated and isolated from each other. You know, a, a, a business concept that comes to mind that that I've heard like a lot of businesses struggle with, a lot of businesses have faced a similar pain point is when their organization or the teams within their organization, uh, they silo, they further divide, um, they yeah. kind of isolate into, you know, whatever team that they're working in. And I think in a lot of ways, it stifles the productivity, it stifles the creativity, it, it, it yeah. slows progress down and it doesn't allow you know this whole organization to move and fire on all the levels that it is capable of and so you know Absolutely. i think that's just, uh you know an illustration to the importance of conversation mm -hmm. yeah and and genuine diversity right like like a lot of times and you know we're running out of time here but like we talk about diversity on, on this like really superficial level a lot of the time, like talk about like skin color or ethnicity or, or gender and stuff like that, which is fine, but that's not the, the diversity that matters. What matters is actually the perspective differences that different people, different individuals bring to bear on a problem, right? Being able to look at something from a lot of different, um, you know, different starting points with a lot of different knowledge sets and a lot of differences in the way your mind goes to creative problem solving. Like I want as, I mean, granted, this is what I try to do as a creative director. Like I want as much of that as possible. And I'd love to see as much of that as possible in society at large. And that's where, that's why, again, like my sort of plea for building a culture that values that is, is part of this. And that's the only thing I wanted to add to the to the overall conversation is I want a culture that values genuine diversity of viewpoint of opinion and doesn't treat that as an opportunity to like find cracks or make somebody an enemy, but find opportunities to connect. Like those are the things that I want our society to do. And I think that's the thing that I'm if I'm worried at all about cancel culture, it's because of that. It's not because, you know somebody got mad, right? Like that's, that's going to happen. Yeah. You know, what I think of cancel culture is similar to what I think about uh, deceptive politicians. Uh, there will always be politicians who promise us easy goodies uh, in exchange for our freedom. Goodies that not only are enticing, but that they can't even deliver on anyway. 
you know, um, there will always be that. And that's not the part that worries me. The part that worries me are is how easy it is for so many people to just be convinced that this is a good deal. Right. And, 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 and there will always be politicians who promise easy goodies in exchange for freedom. But if you can get to the individuals who believe in them and you can sell those individuals on the reality of their personal power, then we can render those other folks irrelevant. And I think there's something similar about cancel culture. I think I don't even try to reason with people that are uncharitable. I don't even try to reason with people who get their kicks by trying to figure out the latest gossip about what celebrity is sleeping with who or you know who ate what for lunch or what somebody tweeted 20 years ago like I'm I'm just not that's not even the audience that I'm talking to they're going to do yeah. what they do and their choice has already been made but I believe that any victories that are won in the realm of freedom are going to be won by the people who have something substantial to say by by people who who are ready to use their voices to speak on behalf of truth and if you're out there and you're afraid of con cancel culture, I'm going to say to you, the worst form of cancellation is self-cancellation. Don't mute yourself or censor yourself or silence yourself by creating a self-fulfilling prophecy that someone else is going to do that to you in the future. Don't do it now because so you fear someone else is going to do it later. We're not going to win that way. The second thing is don't think about what you want to say just in terms of like some isolated point you want to make, some slam dunk you want to have. Think about it within the context of your purpose. Like, what are you here for? What's your why? What's your long game? Because everything that you could have an opinion about doesn't even need to be said. You don't need to be a part of every discussion and every battle. Optimize for the things that you want to create and for the calling that you want to fulfill. And don't be so quick, lastly, to dismiss anything that you say that doesn't land properly as cancel culture. Use it as an opportunity to learn. Use it as an opportunity to use that feedback to become a better salesperson or a pitch person for your ideas. And then lastly, don't let cancel culture narratives determine your legacy. That guy that you said who helped raise a million dollars for charity, did that million dollars go to charity still? It did. Still did. Know your impact. Know your impact, right? That's a difference that you made that nobody else can take away from you. And sometimes, we don't always get to control what the public narrative is about the life that we live, but you've got to create your own narrative and, and live consistently yeah. with your own values and not let other people's labels that they slap on you intimidate you into a state of believing that your life doesn't make a difference. And I believe that's yeah. the most fundamental truth. That's the lesson of Christmas movie. It's a wonderful life, right? Just because you don't get the fanfare. <laughs> doesn't mean that your individual life hasn't made a difference. And having that kind of confidence, I think, can give a lot of strength and motivation to rise above a fear of somebody canceling you. you do what you were born to do. Yeah, man. Uh, I love that you managed to weave in a Christmas movie. I was about what to say I do. the same thing. <laughs> it, it, uh, it's inevitable. All right, dude. Many uh, have tried to cancel me for listening to Christmas music every day. It's, it's never going to happen. Christmas music is undefeatable. You can't cancel it's Christmas. One of, it's, it's one of the many things I love about you, sir. I'm, hey, I'm, man. I, I, yeah, I got I to gotta, I gotta head out, man. You, uh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Just love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us, brother. See us, see us every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 12. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Peace.